What is happening, party people? It is a new Wind Up podcast today. I am your host, Mike of MTGA Wines. Thank you so much for being with me once again. We are getting into some more wine business today. Uh, specifically, we had a question at the uh, in our last show regarding the wine business and kind of how you structure it. How do you actually get started in the wine industry and what is going to really kind of set you up for success within it? And it's a really a great question. It's not. It was not so much. I, I took it as, and maybe I maybe I listened to it incorrectly, uh, but I took it as not so much like, hey, what's your corporate structure going to be like? What varieties are you focusing on? So on and so forth. But it's like that beginning stage of your. So you want to get into the wine business. Here are the different avenues to go down to get started. So that's how I took it. That's how we are going to dive into it, because in my mind. Really, there's probably about four ways that a wine business gets started. And we're going to try and cover all four of those in some pretty good detail. And there's really kind of one variable in particular that could span across all of them. But there are really kind of four ways, in my opinion, that you start a wine business in terms of making wine, eventually bottling it, and getting wine sold. And some of them, you know, you're, you're going to know about. You know, these are going to be things that if you frequented Napa and you visited and done some wine tastings here or elsewhere, you're going to understand, you know, some of these. And we'll get, talk about a little bit of the pros and cons, you know, about them, you know, as well. Because, you know, there's obviously certain upsides and downsides to how you put together a business. Like we've probably all been there in some way, shape or form. We've worked for a company where the structure just maybe doesn't quite line up with the efficiency that you need or the goals that you have. And there's always this little bit of like, or maybe there's not just a little friction, there's a lot of friction because certain involved parties simply cannot figure their own shit out, right? So that's something that we're gonna kind of dive in today. And I'm gonna iron out kind of the four avenues first and then from there what we're going to do is kind of circle back and go through a little bit more details of all of them uh before we dive in as always i really truly appreciate all the new follows subscribers uh, please continue to check us out on all of our social networks uh, mtga wines on the instagram the book of face uh, the social network formerly known as Twitter. We're on all those bad boys. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's where we're posting up tasting notes and other videos. I've got a lot more content coming on down the line uh, for all you wine lovers. So we're definitely really keeping things going. Very excited for what we're going to be able to do in the new year with the show. So uh, please continue the support. It means so, so much. Uh, and we will continue providing the best wine show hopefully that we can provide uh, but i do look at this as a collaborative effort i want to give the people what they want so that's why we do the q a's that's why i take a lot of these questions and broad them out to full-length episodes so it is a huge huge help and together we're, i think we're going to make a really cool uh cool sh show about the wine industry and really what it's like kind of booths on the ground to give you all a little bit more insight into what we actually go through all right so the four ways to get to really, really starting a wine business are a couple things. Number one, you are buying land, whether there's an established winery or a vineyard on there, and you just, you just, you either develop it or it's already developed and you just hit the ground running, right? If you're planting vineyard, it's obviously going to take a few years for those vineyards to come into production. Uh, if you have to build a facility, you got to go through that. But we're not going to really touch too much on either of those. Just know, of course, if you're buying a property, it's either established or it's not. And you're going to have to do some work to get it where you want to go. Even if you're buying an established vineyard, there's likely stuff you're going to have to do in order to really dial in the business that you want to have, right? Option number two, maybe you're not buying the land necessarily, or even the vineyard or the winery. You're simply buying grapes. This is actually exactly what I do. This is exactly how I started my wine business 14 years ago. You start buying and sourcing out that stuff. You lease a vineyard. You're actually contracted to buy a certain amount of tonnage. And maybe you rent out a winery facility and pay them to have a space to be able to make your wines. This is 
very typically, if you're if you're trying to get into like winemaking specifically and you don't have a hundred million dollars at your disposal, this is pretty much how it goes because of the cost of land, because of the cost of, you know, building a facility, planting a vineyard. It's so, so cost prohibitive in this day and age. Certain areas, you know, if you're in a little bit more of an emerging wine area, you might have a little bit better shot at doing that. But if you're trying to move into Napa, buy an established property or build out your own, it's you're going to need some coin. You're going to need a lot of coin to be able to make that happen. There's a reason why the cliche out here is like, oh, you want to make 10 million in the wine industry? You probably should start with about 100 million. That's probably about where it stands in this day and age. Number three is going to be you're a wine blender. You're not actually making the wine. Someone else is, and it is sold, and this is what maybe some of you don't know about the wine industry, is that a lot of wineries who make wine have certain lots that they just aren't going to use. Or they're making wine as kind of cheaply as they can and efficiently, and they're selling it as bulk wine to other producers. You know, this is the same, I mean, you have the big producers doing this uh, that are creating like these white label brands where they're just buying up lots and lots and lots as best they can so they can say, hey, this is the new red blend that we have. And every year they'll dial it in as they see fit, but you're not actually having to spend the money on the vineyard, the grapes, the facilities. You're probably going to have to organize some sort of bottling house and blending house with some tank space to be able to knock that out. But the huge benefit to buying these lots that no one else wants on this bulk market is that it's a lot cheaper than buying fruit. It's way, 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 way cheaper than buying a property and making your own wines at that property. You can do it for pennies on the dollar. To give you a little bit of perspective on that, and I'm going to, you know, there's a big old caveat with this way of doing it, but to give you a little bit of perspective, you know, if you're paying, you know, $9,000 for two tons of Cabernet to make, you know, roughly six, or sorry, for a ton of Cabernet to make about 600 bottles, you know, that your cost there is going to be, you know, rough, you know, what is it, $15? per bottle just for the grapes, nothing else. Like you're not paying for the labor, none of your other overhead corks, bottles, all that's excluded. Just 15 bucks for the, the juice. And this is Napa specifically, by the way. Grapes are a lot cheaper outside of Napa, a lot cheaper. But if you're buying on that bulk market, it's not gonna be the super high end, like really great stuff. Like that, this is the downside, is you're not getting the best of the best, you're getting the dregs of what other people don't wanna use. It's The wine's fine. It's probably well made. It's probably clean. It might not be, uh, but at least it's cheaper. And you might get halfway decent Cabernet for somewhere between sixty to eighty dollars a gallon, which you're gonna get about. I think it's about five bottles per gallon, like roughly. Maybe it's a little less than that, but it's a lot cheaper. You're not getting maybe exactly what you want, but I've talked forever about kind of the tricks of the trade and how wines are doctored up with additives and extracts and everything. So if you're trying to make that $12.99 bottle of wine, you're going to buy this super, super cheap bulk juice. You're going to be, you're, you'll use whatever thing. You're not using brand new barrels. You're not aging it for three years. You're not doing any of that stuff. You're getting it to market as quickly as you can, as cheaply as you can. And people wonder why they get headaches when they drink their favorite wines from the grocery store because it's heavily processed probably some extra sugar in there all the things uh, but it's just the quality is really not quite there and that's the reason why a lot of these bulk wine places are just slinging juice they're like we don't want it someone else can use it we want nothing to do with this stuff so those are really kind of the three major ways the fourth one is kind of the the sprinkling across all these that you can use and that is having business partners or investors. I say it's kind of the fourth way because it does create a, a, a certain level of dynamics that you now have to work with, right? You have people to answer to. You have people who would have invested their hard-earned money and they're trying to figure out, hey, how are we going to make this profitable and how are we going to make this you know, beneficial to all parties involved? If you're like me and you start a wine business on your own, self-funded, no investors, you don't have to answer to anybody. You can kind of do whatever you want 
but you do have to make sure that the business plan makes sense. And if you're like me, you're probably gonna fuck it up somewhere along the way, like I did, and for the first few years, lost, and I mean lost, a lot of money because I simply wasn't doing things the way I should be as a responsible business owner. Uh, it, it was a very steep learning curve, and that's where having investors can have one, that bankroll. You know, if you have a lot of people to pool money from, that really, really helps. You look at Hall Vineyards and the number of investors that they took on and the quote unquote owners they have. It's not like ownership of the Green Bay Packers. Like you have your stock certificate and like, technically I'm an owner. You're like, yeah, you have one share. So calm down. You know, Hall kind of did the same thing where they were like, hey, we're going to take on these investors and now you have a piece of this and we have our like annual big meeting, but that helped fund so many things for their facility. I think mostly their facility in St. Helena, uh, but more specifically, uh, their facility, I, no, I think it was specifically their facility in St. Helena, maybe not so much the one in Rutherford up on the hill, uh, but that was a great way to like, hey, we need some funds. Let's make this happen. I've had plenty of people approach me over the years like, hey, are you looking for investors? Like, we really want to get into the wine industry, but we don't quite have the capital to buy our own. We'd like to be a piece of something else. And I very politely said no because I don't want to have to answer to anybody else. So that's really kind of the fourth way is you take any one of those three and then you sprinkle in some investment money, VC money, whatever you want to call it, and you go from there. So those are kind of the four major things. And that was the short answer to that question from our November Q&A was, here are the four ways to do it. Uh, but I would not do them each justice if I didn't dive into the details of each one nearly as much as I have. So here we go. Mm. Actually, hold on a second. I think my mic stopped working. Oh, wait, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Please pause for station identification. Technical difficulties. Ba -ba -ba -ba. You love to see it. This is what happens when you do things live and you're flying solo. You can't. You don't have like a producer to go back and do this for you. So I got to make a note here. Because I'm pretty sure my mic cut out. It looks like the sound balances are better now. All right. So we have our four ways that we've lined out, right? And let's just kind of work through them top to bottom. Now, when you're buying a winery property, kind of like we were talking about, you're going to have to have the capital to do so. Because if you're, I mean, I can't remember what the exact price per acre is out here in California. The per Gallo purchasing the Stagecoat Vineyard kind of set the big precedent because it was such a big property. And I think that was, what, $320, $340 an acre for planted vineyard. Um, a lot of that vineyard's not actually planted, if I remember. Like a lot of properties, like there's plenty of planted vineyard, but there's also a lot of just, you know, forest land or whatever, like plains, whatever you want to call it, um, where grapes aren't going to be planted. Uh, you also have to build out or maybe be purchasing a winery facility, right? which just comes at a cost. Uh, you're gonna be spending very likely, if you're trying to buy into the wine business in Napa, you're talking tens of millions of dollars. Um, it's why you see, and I haven't seen the price tags on some of these, uh, but like when we talked about some winery acquisitions in the, in the last Q&A as well, you know, when Joseph Phelps sells, when Schaefer sells, oh, you're talking tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in some situations. I mean, hell, even The Prisoner, which was started as, if I am not mistaken, started as one of those bulk wine brands. If that with no land, no facility, just sourcing fruit and buying bull, or sourcing juice and just being a blending house. I think the first time, you know, when Dave Finney finally sold that, I think it was somewhere for the tune of 40 or 60 million bucks to the Huneus family who owns Contessa. Um, so that was without any of that stuff. Just the brand alone had enough clout and market share where people were like, we need to snap this up because we're going to make a killing. And guess what? The Huneus family did because they sold the prisoner brand, I think to Constellation, right, for over $300 million, or, may, it, or maybe maybe it was like half that, but either way, they easily doubled their money on that investment. So when just the brands in some situations are going for things, now factor in, you know, the, the, uh, the land, the vineyards, the winery facility, all this other stuff, um, it, it can be pretty nuts. Pretty, pretty nuts. Um, let me do, I got to pause here for a quick second. I feel like I keep seeing, 
the camera that I'm using, like zooming in, zooming out. And I don't know why, because I don't have, do I have, oh, I do have the auto on, apply. Okay, there we go. All right, hopefully that helps. I kept seeing like the camera like and me like going in and out of like focus. So if someone's actually watching this, I hope you're not getting like some, <laughs> it just looked weird and I think I fixed it. We'll see. It looks like it looks a lot better already, which is good. Um, so, you know, if you're starting, if you're just talking about a brand, like a bulk wine brand, that's just crushing it like that. Now it's a whole different thing, right? It's a whole different ball game. Um, and when you're talking about Joseph Phelps or a Schaefer um, or a Rombauer that has some of their own property now, you know, that that's a whole different kind of thing in the way, in the way this business kind of ratchets up when you're talking about some of these mergers, acquisitions and, and whatnot. So when you're buying a, a property like that, and in this day and age, and this there's one property in particular, um, I, I don't know if this is, this is what some of their employees have told me. I have not talked to the owner specifically about this, but he's a, you know, he's got a, a couple of billion in the bank and he, he built out a winery up on the Silverado Trail. And according to kind of the business plan, they got the winery built, some vineyards planted. They, you know, bought this property for a lot of money as it was. And by the time they had the facility belt, the hospitality center, everything kind of dialed in, ready to go. I think it was close to like a cool hundred million dollar project. Not exactly cheap, right? In terms of how to get into the wine industry. Like that was like a no expense spared, hired on a killer consulting winemaker, like just went big into it. And what was wild to me, allegedly, is that the owner is basically of the opinion that, hey, that hundred million bucks is just a sunk cost. That just is what it is. Now that the winery's open, we have wine to sell, we're starting at zero. And we gotta figure out how we get to be profitable with our operating costs now. Which number one just like blew my mind. I'm like, I don't I've never I, I it's I'm lucky to have like a comma in my bank account, right, at times. Um, and it's not exactly anything more than like a few figures, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, we are a very small mom and pop shop. We are not at all in that echelon. We did not make a lot of money in tech and all of a sudden can do this kind of stuff, um, or, you know, banking or wherever. Um, and for someone to say, oh, that hundred million is just a sunk cost. It was like, oh shit. <laughs> all right. Cool. That's a uh, that's a different kind of um, wealth you got going on. And some and, and actually, someone asked me, they're like, "How could you even consider a hundred million just like the sunk cost?" I'm like, "This is how. It's in the merger and acquisition mode, because you're going to start selling wine. You're going to you hopefully you get to be profitable at some point. Uh, you know, that's hopefully the goal. I mean, if this is just a great expense for him, I mean, all right, fine, more power to you. But if that business actually gets to be profitable, you can start chipping away at that. Minus, you know, of course, whatever interest and or things that you've leveraged to uh, get that all done in the first place. Shoot, if you paid cash for that, good for you. Good for you. But now think of the example of like the prisoner selling for tens of millions of dollars. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, if we, we get to be profitable within, you know, a few years and we're making money and we're chipping away at that, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's isn't necessarily going to be a generational business or we have an opportunity to sell it to the highest bidder. Now, now you're looking at trying to scratch back as much of that sunk cost as you can. It comes back typically, I would say, in the sale of that property and the sale of those brands, right? That's it, It's that long-term like real estate investment at that point. So, Allegedly, it was the sunk cost thing, but even in the back of my own head, I'm like, okay, but if you sell the brand and the, and the winery and all the inventory, I mean, you could probably scrap back a decent chunk of that change as long as the business became profitable and you were already chipping away at it, right? Like, that's probably how that would work. I should also, I should have prefaced this. I am by no means a business expert. I just know what's worked for me. And I've been in this industry for most of my life, and this is just the experience and the thoughts that are in my head. I definitely don't have a business degree. I definitely don't know anything really about finance except how to read a P&L, which is arguably, I think, kind of the most important thing that you should be able to do. Um, and I know how to put together, I think, a halfway decent business plan and budget. I'm really good at budgeting, actually. Um, but 
That said, I'm sure there's someone out there that knows a lot more about this. Please feel free to leave notes in the comments to critique this. I'm just going to try, I'm, I'm winging it here because this is how I always do it. I record this live and then I post it. So if there's something I missed, there's probably something I'm misspeaking on, but this is the way I look at it. And there's probably some like actual proper like financial terms that are like, hey, this is actually what this is, not this. Feel free to call me out. No harm, no foul. That's just, yeah. I, I'm just not that guy. I'm the small family mom and pop business, and I've just tried to pick up as much knowledge as I can from people who are way smarter than me when it comes to finances, you know? So even if you do spend Boku bucks on the property, whether it's yourself or, again, if you have investors of some sort, and this is something that one of my best friends told me uh, years ago. I mean, we, you know, we actually just got back from a lovely trip to Atlanta with him, and we always talk a lot of shop. Um, he's been in wine and hospitality basically for his whole life, as have I. So we all, we, he's one of my best friends, and we we get together and and we just start. We always talk shop, and one of the most important things that he impressed on me because he definitely had a little bit. He went to school for for a little bit more of this kind of entrepreneurial like business stuff, and knows a lot more about it than I do. Is you kind of start, you have a business plan, but you also need to have your exit strategy, right? Like that's what you have also have to dial in because if you got to pull the ripcord at some point, you better know how to do it or at least have some sort of plan that you can implement. So in regards to like buying a property, like going whole hog into the wine business, right? The escape hatch is you sell the place or at least that's one of the escape hatches or you pass it off to a next generation or whatever the case may be, right? Like you have a couple of ways to take this successful business and kind of create this generational thing. And that is, I mean, very, very typically, the wine businesses that are truly successful are the ones that become generational. The one-offs very, very rarely actually get to some killer point where the owners are kind of living the life. It's just, it's not that kind of industry. Because the second it changes hands, you know, they, whoever owned it previously gets to cash out. They call it good. They call it quits. And then the next generation, whether that's actual family or just another business that is going to be the next generation, you know, they get bought out. There's still, it's a new generation of that business, in my opinion, even if it's not the original owners, it's still changing hands and moving on. That's where it can become more successful because in theory, maybe, uh, depending on inflation and interest rates and everything else, depending on what you're buying that business for, hopefully it's really, really successful already. And if you have the ability to expand on that, it just goes ham. You're going back to the prisoner as, as an example, as I think, and I, I've never actually sat down with Dave Finney uh, to talk about this. I would love to. Is the, like this idea of you know how you scale up and how and what the potential is. But you see what you know he did with this brand, and obviously was very, very successful in starting it and eventually selling it. And then you see what Huneus did to even broaden that even even more. And now you see what Constellation is doing with it. And I don't know what exactly their numbers are with this brand, but hey, if they bought it for tens of millions or hundreds of millions, you know, in theory, they're recouping that pretty fast. That within like within their total production and their total sales, like they're already making a killing with this particular brand. And that next now that the prisoner is in essence on its third generation of ownership, you know, it's just crushing it. At least that's what it seems like from the outside. I have no idea what the numbers are. I don't have any friends that work for Constellation, I don't think. Not that they would tell me anyway. That's probably pretty privileged information. But even think of it this way, if it's a family business, you know, the first generation put in all this time, all this effort, all this money. This gentleman I'm talking about on the Silverado Trail, let's say, you know, yeah, that 100 million is actually a sunk cost. He has no interest in selling the business. He wants to pass it on to the next generation. And if that business is profitable and they're paying some of that down, they're understanding, hey, if we continue, you know, chipping away at this, eventually we refinance, the interest rates go down, hopefully, and all of a sudden, like, we're making more money than we were, you know, and it starts to make a little bit more sense for the next generation and then the generation after that and so on and so forth. You know, there's a one of my favorite places that I went to um, on our honeymoon in Alsace. We go, I, I'm going to completely butcher the name. I don't remember what town it's in and my French is atrocious. So someone, you know, please forgive me. But it was this place, I think the Barm Boucher, I think. Amazing, amazing wines. We shrub were hosted by, in essence, the matriarch of the family. 
And she says, oh, my sons would normally be hosting you, but they're out beekeeping right now. You know, we've had this property in our generations. We've managed it and been farming it and been making wines for 13 generations. Think about that. 13 generations off the same land, the same property, just the family doing their thing. And I'm sure it hasn't all been, you know, sunshine and rainbows, but hot damn, you're keeping this thing in the family for 13 generations. I might be a third if our family business, you know, goes down that path. And I honestly don't know if it will, but the hope is that it will, I suppose. But it's, it's just, it's crazy, right? And think like, all right, land is probably paid off. You may have leveraged it, you know, for, uh, you know, a, a business loan here or there to invest more into the property and equipment and all these other things or a replant, whatever. Um, you know, you're probably hopefully using it to your advantage, but that's when you're like, oh, we're just doing the thing. We're just doing the thing. And the family's doing all the, you know, all the work. So I'm sure they earn, you know, a certain like salary or whatever, but like, that's when you're like, okay, now we're just crushing it. And it's, it, it, it really, it, that was really impactful on me because it's so rare to see generational business day in this kind of globalized world and with how easy it is to get out of your hometown and do whatever you want to do. You're no longer just stuck on the family farm, right? I mean, there are so many cool businesses that just end up, you know, rolling up shop and folding because the next generation is just not in it. They're not interested because they don't have to be. They can move to the big city. They can move to a new country. And it's just so different now. Um, so my nostalgia, you know, feels that like in my core, it hurts a little bit, but I understand and I understand so that even that huge investment, kind of back to it, that was a nice little tangent there. But so that original investment into that brick and mortar, you know, we're going to start a winery in such and such place. There are plenty of ways to go about making that happen, making it work. Now, the ins and outs of how that business operates, are you distributing your wine? Are you more allocation list and wine club? You know, those are all things that you're going to have to figure out as a part of that business plan. But as far as like the overarching structure of how we're getting this started, there's nothing like doing that and having full and total control. Now, the second option I mentioned where you're not necessarily, you know, buying a property or building a winery, but you're buying grapes. This is, again, exactly what I do. This is what many, many small producers do is that you're buying grapes, you're leasing a vineyard and you're saying, hey, I'm going to buy X amount of tons of fruit for you. And then I'm going to rent out a production space and I'm going to make my wines there. That way, I don't have to spend $100 million on a property. I don't have to invest all this money. I can do this on a dime. Now, it is still expensive. Um, it's still going to cost you some coin, but we're nowhere near the tens of millions of dollars that we're talking here initially. You know, it is a lot more cheap and cheerful, and you still get to really kind of have a hand in the winemaking. Now, the downside, of course, is that if you're custom crushing at a facility, that's what we call it when you're kind of renting out that property and using it as your uh, as your crush facility, is that typically you're not the one with the hands-on winemaking stuff. You're submitting what we call you know work orders to that seller crew and saying, hey, I need you to knock out X, Y, Z. This is, in essence, my order of operations, but you have to take care of it. That's typically how that works. Um, you lose there. You do lose a little bit of control with that because you don't have your boots on the ground doing all of the day to day today. I am a little bit of an exception with that because it's a family business and a family property. We all kind of work together a little bit in certain times with certain things, especially around harvest and bottling, like really the high impact stuff. So that's always like, hey, let's lend a hand and yeah, go ahead. We're not using this pump. Go ahead and knock out whatever work you got to do. It's a little bit, that is a very flexible area for me. There, I, there are very few people that have that luxury because you're normally having to rent out a facility that you have no relationship to. Maybe you know them as colleagues, but you don't have the type of control that you do with your own facility or someone like me who has had family in the business. So that can be a downside. And I know plenty of people uh, one of my other best friends in particular who moved a lot of his wines to a particular custom crush facility that will remain nameless because I don't want to get in trouble uh, <laughs> and had just the most awful experience. Like those work orders I were ta was talking about were not getting fulfilled on time. The, his barrels were not getting 
taken care of. In fact, he walked in there one day and just saw wine like leaking down the cave and was like, is someone going to find out where this is coming from? Anybody? Or are we just going to let this barrel drain and find it at some point in the future? Shoot, that happened at the family property a couple months ago. I go into the cellar. I'm checking up on our white wines that have been going through fermentation from this harvest. And sure enough, I see some purple running down the hallway. I'm like, well, shit, we got to find out where that's coming from because that's that's going to cause a problem. And sure enough, I find a barrel. And this happens every once in a while is that these barrels, because they're handmade, uh, they can have like little imperfections and stuff. And maybe they don't seal just perfectly. And that's what happened with this barrel. It was a new barrel. So we knew it wasn't a boar beetle that had like gotten in there and like created a leak. Uh, but luckily we have a, a toolbox with some wedges and cones. So I get back there and I find it. I rinse it off with a bunch of water, find where the leak's coming from. And I just grab a cone and <laughs> hammer that in there, wash it off with a bunch of water, dry it. So, and just sit there and wait for a minute to see if any additional wine continues leaking out the back. It didn't. I went about my business, kind of did what I had to do. And then I came back just to double check it and it had stopped leaking. I, I like to think that anybody would do that. You're like, hey, wine's on the floor. It shouldn't be there. Maybe we should figure out where the fuck it's coming from. And apparently this facility that I'm talking about just didn't like to do that for some reason. Um, hopefully that was just a one-off and it was just bad timing. Um, but that's, you know, a really big downside when you're having to rent out a space and rely on other people is that if those other people aren't reliable, I mean, all of a sudden you find yourself up a creek without a paddle in no time flat. And he ended up moving a lot of his wines. I think maybe all of his wines out of that facility very, very quickly um, after some very bad instances uh, with them, which is, which sucks. Cause you, you like to, hopefully you get to see the best in people and they get to put in a lot of good work and, do what you do and just make, you know, teamwork, make the dream work kind of mentality. But sometimes that doesn't happen, but it is, if you're looking to kind of get into wine and you're trying to find arguably the easiest Avenue to still have a hand in the winemaking and the stylistic considerations, but not having to invest tens of millions of dollars, the custom crush thing is the way to go. It's still expensive. It still comes with a lot of trials and tribulations like any business model does. But at least you're not having to take out a, you know, but at least it's just affordable, in my opinion. That's why I still do what I do. I'm in, in currently in the planning process of like, all right, what's it really going to take to buy a small piece of land or fuck even a warehouse somewhere if it's in South Napa in the corporate park where I can actually like have my own facility. Like I'm, I'm this is definitely not even a five year plan. This is more like a 10 year plan or more, but you know, that's like, that's, I'm starting to try and piece that together. I'm 14 years into this and I'm just starting to be like, Hey, I wonder what it would take if we had like our own facility and we could actually just do everything ourselves and scale up or down or take on custom crush clients ourselves and do it all in like one space. That would be rad. It's kind of my entrepreneurial spirit, like coming, coming back in a little bit and saying like, Hey, maybe there's some other fun shit we can do out there. And actually that is, this is kind of the blurring between these first two that we've talked about is this is how a lot of places will actually make a little bit more money right out the gate is that they'll build enough space and they will permit themselves appropriately so that they can be a custom crush facility. There are a lot of the newer facilities out there that have been built that have built in this idea of like, Hey, we're going to allow for custom crush and we can rent out our facilities to other people because that's just cash flow, baby. You're, they are paying you rent. And if you can do that, you can use that money to help you make the wines you want to be making, right? Isn't that an old adage in business? Is that the best way? To, it's like one of the best ways to make money is with other people's money. So if they're paying your rent for you or your mortgage for you and you get to make the wine you want to make, just gravy, print that money, baby. So that's, that's kind of like the blending of those two a little bit where it's like you go big with the facility, but then you have enough space to rent it out and help recoup a lot of the cost of operation. Boom. There you go. That's the good stuff. Again, kind of teamwork, making the dream work. And that's why that's what can be advantageous about having your own facility is that it, it opens up a lot more doors where if you actually don't have complete and to total control of that custom crush facility, things can happen. Things can happen. Now, the last way we're talking about, about this kind of bulk wine thing, and I've had, I've had plenty of people uh, come to me and actually ask me to do this, and I haven't, 
um, because and it's been you know you know clients and even a couple of cold calls are like hey we're trying to make kind of our own custom label it's typically been very small lots we're talking you know a barrel to like maybe 100 cases or something and to be completely honest it's a total hassle for me and i want kind of nothing to do with it but it's also the idea that i didn't have a hand in actually like making these wines so i don't really want to have my name on them in any way shape or form like i would have to have like here's my like nda like i'll blend them for you but I'm, you can't tell them that I made it because this wine's not going to be representative of my style and what I do in terms of winemaking. But if you're paying pennies on the dollar for, you know, this juice that these other wineries aren't using, th this is the cheapest and most cheerful way to get into the wine industry. Because from there, all you need is a blending bottling house. And there are plenty of those that will say, hey, we'll have all this juice trucked to you. We'll blend it and we'll just bottle it and boom, you have your white label brand like that. For those of you that are thinking this is a great idea, I can't believe no one's doing this. Everybody's already doing this. I hate to break it to you. Uh, there are, I mean, some of us aren't because I'm too selfish. I don't want to sell a wine that I actually haven't made. You know what I mean? Some of us have standards. I'm, I'm kidding. That's just a dig. But if you're looking to make some money in the wine industry, this is probably the way to do it. If you really want to do it, you don't need a winemaker. You can just start messing around in your kitchen with samples and figuring out what you like. Now, hiring someone like me does help in that sense. And by the way, this is not a sales pitch, but having someone who knows the logistics and the operations and you know how this blending thing can play nicely with the other lots that, you know, if, when blending these lots, how to get them to play nicely together, it, it is nice to have a professional opinion. I'll put it that way. It's nice to have a consultant or something in some way that gets you to the finish line. That'll definitely help. But if you're looking to make a $12.99, $15.99, $29.99, cheap, cheerful, crushable wine, shoot, man, this is the way to do it. It's the way to do it. It's way easier. A lot of the hard work's already been done. All you got to do is put the puzzle together and slap whatever fake label you want on it and sell it as it is. You know, no harm, no foul. Um, but that's how, you know, these white label brands are created. Whether it is, you know, someone like a, you know, I don't, I'm sure Gallo does do this, but, you know, they even, they own some high-end properties. Kendall Jackson owns some high-end properties. There are certain lots from those high-end spots, like a Cardinal or a La Coya or something that aren't going to make it into those flagship wines of those small brands, but they're not going to let those really nice wines go to waste. They're probably going to end up in something somewhere on down the line because they can just repurpose it in-house. So there are big companies that do that just naturally because they're like, hey, we don't want the, these wines. We're not going to make a ton of anyway. If there are certain lots we're not into for these wines, we'll just whoosh, move them on down the line and just reintegrate them into their production somewhere else. I mean, or you are just kind of this bottling house. And you say, hey, we are working with X chain restaurant or retailer, and we're just going to custom blend and bottle this wine for them you know um, it's something that uh, even my folks have done where they have more wine than they know what to do with they created a custom label for someone a custom blend they said all right here's your four pallets of wine that you want for your i think it was a retail chain a restaurant chain i can't remember which but they're like hey now you have like a handmade handcrafted napa wine that we weren't going to do it we'll sell it to you for a good price because this is wine we just wouldn't use in the first place and all of a sudden you have an in for this kind of distribution, you know, through retail or restaurant chains or, you know, bigger, you know, stores or like multiple locations that have like their own custom Napa blend. Uh, again, teamwork making the dream work. So this bulk wine thing, I mean, it's I, I like to talk a lot of trash about it because in my opinion, you're not you're a wine blender, not a wine maker. And I find that there is a very big distinction between those two. Um, some like to muddy those waters a little bit more fine. Uh, but you didn't actually make that wine. Someone else made it for you. And you're, you're the mad scientist with your, you know, beakers and graduated cylinders and things putting it together, which can be tough. It's why someone like a Dave Finney was so successful. He was really fucking good at it. And if I'm speaking out of turn, and he wasn't just doing the bulk wine thing for the prisoner, and he was actually making some of those wines, Dave, I apologize. But that's what I've heard. 
which means I should probably talk to this guy at some point and figure out if that's actually the case. Um, but, you know, it, when you have someone who that's talented at putting wines together like that, shoot, you can do pretty well for yourself. And and the prisoner is in essence like the, the, right? Like, you know, example of that. Outside of like maybe, a, I'm sure there are other brands that have killed it. Uh, I don't even know, like the way Mayomi sold. I don't know how much of that was bulk wine versus how much they were actually making. But man, you build a business and sell it for tens of millions, hundreds of millions. You must have been doing something right. You know, it might not be the craft wines that some of us are used to where it is a mom and pop shop like ourselves. But it's hard to argue with the numbers when you're commanding that much market share and you can sling that company to some larger company for Boku bucks and then have that fund whatever else you want to be doing, man. I mean, can't argue with that. So those three ways are really kind of like the... I mean, pick your poison. Each one has its benefits. Each one has its downsides. The other big downside, actually, to the bulk wine thing is that if you can't get the same lots that you like or need year in and year out, you got to do a lot of shopping around. So logistically, it can be kind of tough. And as a result, creating the same or a similar wine for like vintage consistency year in and year out can be a challenge. But that's why you we have our big old lab books that people send us during harvest. Like, hey, here are all the items that you can use to enhance your wines. Add this, dash of that, sprinkle of this, and your wine will taste the same year in and year out. So even the folks that are just blending and bottling and not actually doing the winemaking, they still have an ace up their sleeve to make their wine consistent year in and year out. So they can do it very affordably and sell a lot of it and not have to worry about vintage variation, which is, hey, to each their own, to each their own. Now, the fourth way that I mentioned is that investor thing, and that kind of spans across all four of these. And, I, and even though they're this, you know, we, we'd be talking about the same, you know, issues here, here and there between all these, you know, facets, when you have investors, obviously, or, or, a, or shareholders, right, it adds a layer of complexity. Because now you have more people that you need to answer to. And there are more people that you need to keep happy. Even within our own family business of four family members between my grandparents on my dad's side and my parents, there were still plenty of issues. Because in essence, all four of them, because they pulled their life savings together to get Anderson's Con Valley Vineyard started back in the 80s. You know, throughout, you know, my childhood, I remember some of the issues, some of the, you know, having it out at family dinner moments, you know what I mean? And even within, I mean, family businesses are tough. I mean, I think we all can, we all know that, but, you know, it can be, I honestly, I think it's a little bit easier. Yeah. The emotional stuff can really mess with those family relationships, but at a certain point, your family, you still love each other, hopefully. Might not be the case for everybody, even in mine in some situations. Um, but when you have an extra layer of someone who's removed, and especially if you have investors or folks that are not in the wine industry and do not know kind of the order of operation things, the ebb and flows of the wine industry, uh, this is something that's happening in a big way right now in Napa because Napa has had one of the slowest years in terms of like tourism and traffic that it's had in a long, long time. And a lot of people financially are pretty strapped as a result. Um, the sales and the numbers just aren't there. And I've heard more than a couple of stories of some, you know, investors and business partners and things who just aren't in the wine industry who are trying to like grapple with this. And there are a couple of businesses that I know of that are I think making some pretty significant errors in their decision making as, as a result, because this is just the ebb and flow of the tides that we're dealing with. The, I mean, you go back to 08 to 11, the same thing happened. Um, there are always kind of these years that are great, years that are really, really not great. Uh, we are coming off a historical 2021 and 2022, I think, in terms of the success and the popularity of Napa wines and how many visitors 
we've had. But by mid-2022, it was like the faucet shut off. And luckily, the first half of that year was great because the second half was garbage. We love you all so much. Thank you for the support. But in terms of like grand scheme business stuff, it was super, super slow in the latter half of 2022. And that's continued this year. And it's been a struggle for a lot of people. And now that you have those investors, you know, if you happen to have those investors and those outside people now saying, hey, these numbers are not where they need to be. How are we going to deal with this? And they haven't been here to see the ebbs and flows of this industry. And they're expecting just their X return on their investment every single year. This is when you have to have some really, really tough conversations. And it's why we haven't taken on any investors for our own labels and our own projects is because we just don't want to have to answer to anybody. You know, it, it's literally that simple. We want to be able to do the creative things that we want to do and not have to ask for permission. I like begging for forgiveness. <laughs> I'm going to make executive decisions. We're just going to go for it. That's not completely true. I try, I mean, even with you, we all know who the HBIC is in this relationship. There are for sure things I make sure she's in the loop on before we start doing anything wine business wise. Again, teamwork makes the dream work. And, but I've had, I, there are plenty of horror stories out there, and I'm sure some of you can also or also have some experience with this where a business takes on a certain new investor or sh new shareholders or whatever the case is, and things start to change. And maybe, the, and change can be tough, no doubt about it. I remember that when um, Boisset Family States purchased Raymond Vineyards when I was there. Uh, Jean-Charles Boisset made a lot of changes after the first six months that a lot of people weren't particularly happy about. Granted, that's new ownership. I mean, that's a little bit of a different, you know, thing. But, you know, if you have new people at the top with new ideas, whether those new ideas are good or bad, might be up for discussion. And if the people below them disagree with those new I don't know, avenues you're going down, it can get a little dicey. It can get a little dicey. And if it's someone from outside of the industry who just doesn't have the boots on the ground experience that those who have been in there for a long time do, it can it can ruffle a lot of feathers and create a lot of issues. So even though that integrates really well into those three kind of main avenues we talked about, I do separate out the partnership and investor thing because that in my opinion creates just such a different can of worms and so and just a lot of other dynamics that even if you're in one of those three first sections um, that are segments of how you built your wine business adding in more complexities in terms of ownership can be really really tough uh, and challenging and it yeah I guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to tell some really interesting stories that I am probably going to get in a lot of trouble for. This I'm going to have to keep my mouth shut about that. And on that note, I think that'll do it for this episode. I really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much, as always, for the amazing support, for uh, downloading, sharing. Don't forget to like the episodes. One more time, be sure to check us out on YouTube, Book of Face, uh, the network formerly known as Twitter. Instagram, all at MTGA Wines. Be sure to like, subscribe, share, do all the things. Really, really appreciate you. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. We will see you next week for another episode of the Wind Up Podcast. Cheers.